Thank you. All right, now, so, man, this high class. That's nice for you if you need it. What's that? Oh, high thank class. you. <laughs> it's a nice building. They, uh, I wish we had something is, just as nice on campus at uh, UCO. They just renovated it. Nice tech too. It's kind of a nice little sort of open meeting area right here. Yeah. It's awesome. What I like about it also is that if you're a student, you're sort of walking by. Yeah, that's what I'm And it sort of draws people in as opposed to what I have to do is I have to have higher ties and then provide a map to the specific room. Right. So on campus. Yeah. So it's always a struggle to get enough students there. I don't know if we're getting as a result. Yeah. Well, and it's, venue. it's kind of easy to break down. And but normally, they'll have tables and chairs where students can come right. and just study and whatnot. And so it's pretty easy to break that down. Well, have, having that kind of flex space is important these days. That's great. But you know, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to launch on this early. I'm going to do a little bit of sucking up here for a second. Okay. So, mm -hmm. I, I, I incorporated in my opening comments are mission and vision statements for Rose State College. So. Never oh, that I, idea. I, I never did have board. done that before, but mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if our HLC folks would still be around or not. So they? Now they've gone. The, my understanding is they left around 1230 or so. They're on a plane. Uh, hotel no, yeah. You never know when they're going to check the online. Are we ready? Sure, sure, sure. You are. All right, so we, I think, are ready to get started. Um, we're going to be discussing uh, basically my argument of why we're all way better off than we used to be. Uh, before we do that, I do want to recognize, let's see, I know uh, Dr. Ortiz, uh, Dean of the Social Sciences Division, is here with us. Uh, and. Let's see, do we have any other faculty or uh, Chris Meyer, the dean of the library, is back here, who's integral to our things. I don't think I see uh, any other faculty or administration, but I want to thank them. Uh, I want to say a special thank you to uh, some of our sponsors, the Institute for Humane Studies, which uh, they provide a grant to help uh, facilitate these events, and so we want to thank them for their generous support uh, of our efforts with this project. I want to thank uh, McGraw-Hill and Greg Moore, who helps to provide uh, the pizza and refreshments, and so that's uh, an outstanding touch to, to that. So thank you, uh, Greg and McGraw-Hill, and to our social sciences division that helps provide a great deal of uh, logistical support on my end, uh, making sure we have things ready to go uh, for these events. Um, the Rose State College vision is to support, serve, and advance the common good in order to sustain and advance a tradition of excellence. And our mission is to provide higher education programs and services intended to foster lifelong learning for a diverse population. This series of discussions is intended to support both the vision and mission of our college. By bringing experts with diverse points of view on topics of relevance to our students and our community, we're creating an opportunity to hear from and engage with individuals who've studied, worked in, and written or spoken on various topics. These panels can help further your knowledge of these topics and inform your conversations with others, as well as your own academic writing and research. So I want to encourage you to not only ask questions during the designated time, uh, but to also visit with our panelists uh, if they have time after the formal program is over. Uh, I do want to mention, uh, you notice the slide up here, roughly around 3 p.m. that will switch. It'll have a URL and a, a web link for the survey and we ask everyone if you can to please complete that survey. Uh, our um, uh, grantee, grantor uh, uses that information to base its decisions on future funding for these programs and so uh, it always helps to have a lot of uh, folks there. Ah, I do see Dr. Hendricks is in the very back, Dr. Hendricks. Thank you for attending. Get the car, get out of here. <laughs> um, format for this program is going to be slightly different than, than what we've done in the past. Uh, I'm going to offer my remarks on this topic. Uh, then I'm going to introduce our panelists, and they're going to have a go at uh, why I'm wrong. I always like to put it that way. They're going to explain to me why I don't know what I'm talking about. I thought it was called to agree with yes. you. Uh, well, that we works too. That. Okay. I, I always need somebody on my side. Awesome. So. 
so, um, but, uh, uh, and we'll just have a conversation among us, uh, and then roughly at about uh, 3 o'clock, for the last 30 minutes or so, 20 or 30 minutes, we'll open it up for comments from you guys or questions from uh, the audience. We have a microphone set up over here for that purpose, so uh, please, uh, number one, uh, help us facilitate our conversation f by withholding any comments that you might want to make until that time, and then please make use of the microphone. That way, people who are watching online can also hear the question as well as our response. Um, well, let's get started. I'm going to start with this premise. We are all, all, every single one of us, better off than anybody has ever been before. That's my premise. That's my argument, right? Uh, we're wealthier by far than people have ever been before. And let me define wealth for a second, right? Uh, we're talking about living standards. What do we have to make use of? We're talking about levels of poverty. We're talking about access to food, clothing, and housing, and education. Uh, we're talking about levels of violence in our communities, wars, political instability, and life expectancy. All of these, if you look at where we are in 2018 and compare them to previous generations, you will see much less violence, uh, even violence that you see in the news, much less of that today than we've seen in previous generations. You will see less poverty. Uh, and I'm going to run through some, some information on some of this uh, to kind of make that point. Uh, some of this will bleed from some comments that I made in our prior, uh, prior panel, right? So we'll start with that. 1800. The average person lived on a, the equivalent of $3 per day, the modern equivalent of $3 a day. So think about what you could buy with $3 right now, and that's what the average person, right? I'm going to just say more than the average, 90% or more people lived on that amount of income, all right? Today, in the United States and in many other uh, wealthy countries, that number is well over 100, it's close to $130 a day. Uh, and you have less than, globally, less than 10% of the population are living in what the World Bank defines as extreme poverty. In the United States, that number is below about 2%. Um, let's talk about poverty. So it's fallen from 85%, extreme poverty globally has fallen from 85% in 1800 uh, to about, as I mentioned, 10% currently as measured by the World Bank. Uh, food as a portion of disposable income has decreased over that time as well. Uh, violence against women, uh, violence against uh, children, and especially uh, things like uh, mass shootings, these are lower than even just 20 years ago. Uh, the researcher James Allen Fox has done some excellent work on that. Um, there are much fewer wars, international conflicts, and life expectancy in 1800 was about 35 years of age. Today, according to the National Center for Health Statistics, the average lifespan is about 79 years of age. This is tremendous progress. It is, it is progress that we have not seen before in human history. All right? It is progress that we have never experienced over this type of time frame. Uh, and the question that many researchers are asking is, what caused this progress? A good question to ask, right? What caused all of this stuff to change over time? The answer that many are becoming convinced of is that it was innovation that caused this. Now, when we talk about innovation, let's distinguish between that and invention, right? When we define innovation, innovation is a new good service or process that allows individuals to do something they could not do before or do something they currently do more efficiently. And the benefits of this are spread across society. All right? uh, for example, uh, many people don't know, but the steam engine was actually invented by the Greeks All right? about 2,000, a little over 2,000 years ago. But guess what? They didn't know what to do with it. It was basically a 
a toy or a piece of art to them. They had no idea that they could use it to do all the things that subsequently was done during the Industrial Revolution. All right? And so that's the difference between invention and innovation. Well, what caused this increase in innovation is the next question. All right? On that, there's much less agreement. All right? uh, Deidre McCloskey argues that it was an ideological shift that began in the 16, roughly the 1600s, in which how innovators and innovation was perceived by society. Uh, economist Stephen Davies argues that it was uh, the rise in conflict of the, the rising nation states in medieval Europe, which demanded new weaponry, which caused the innovation. Um, economist I think he's an economist, Darren Asimoglu, argues that it was developing institutions, new institutions of governance, that created the way for this innovation to occur. And Harvard psychologist Steven Pinker argues it was, in fact, the Enlightenment and this broad change in how we approach discovery that led to this. Why does it matter? Why does it matter today? Well, it matters for a couple of reasons. Number one, as I mentioned before, it has never happened in recorded history again to have this much growth, this much improvement on such a small, short amount, relatively short amount of time. Uh, knowing what caused it and how we can keep it to continue seems rather important. And finally, it's important for us to appreciate that this has occurred, right? Oftentimes, especially, uh, and I'm going to pick on the, the, the mass media for a second, we don't have a frame of reference. When we talk about problems that exist today, and none of this is to deny that there are problems that exist today, but when we talk about problems exist today, it's really helpful to know what existed before today. How did we get to this point? And if things have been improving, then what can we do to accelerate the improvement, or at the very least, not halt the improvement? And so this is my argument, whether you're at the lowest income level, at the highest income level, the youngest or the oldest, regardless of who you are, you are in a much better position than anyone at your point in time, at your age, in your circumstances has ever been. Uh, and we need to appreciate that and discuss why it is the case and what we can do to keep it going. So that's my argument. I'm going to turn the first to introducing our panelists, and then I'm going to let them um, critique my argument somewhat. All right. I'm going to start with uh, on my immediate, my immediate right, your left, is uh, Professor Tara Hall. Uh, professor Hall is a professor of sociology here at Rose State College where she's been a faculty member since 2012. She attended the University of Oklahoma, where she earned both her bachelor's and master's degrees in sociology. Uh, during her studies, Professor Hall developed a passion for the areas of family and criminology. These topics eventually became her areas of specialization and building blocks for her dissertation, which examines how the media and cultural beliefs about motherhood impact people's perceptions of mothers who use methamphetamines. Professor Hall has taught several courses at Rose State College and the University of Oklahoma, including Introduction to Sociology, Families and Society, Families and Substance Abuse, Sex and Gender, Crime and Delinquency, and the Criminal Justice System. Her areas of interest include drugs and the family, incarceration, social deviance, social stratification, and gender and crime. As a full-time faculty member at Rose State, Professor Hall is a member of several committees, including the Rose State Women's Leadership Conference Committee, the Domestic Violence Awareness Campaign Committee, and the START Summer Bridge Program. Additionally, Professor Hall is a member of the American Sociological Association, the American Society of Criminology, the Society for the Study of Social Problems, and the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences. Please welcome Professor Tara Hall. To my left, uh, your right, is Dr. Ryan Kiggins. Uh, Dr. Kiggins has published articles and book chapters on U.S. Internet governance policy, U.S. cybersecurity policy, and more broadly, 
on the interaction of information technology, global security, and global political economy. Dr. Kiggins earned his bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Utah and his PhD from the University of Florida. Dr. Kiggins is also the editor of two books, The Political Economy of Robots, Prospects for Prosperity and Peace in the Automated 21st Century, and The Political Economy of Rare Earth Elements, Rising Powers and Technological Change. Dr. Kiggins has also authored several book chapters and journal articles that scrutinize various features of politics, public policy, and information technology. Dr. Kiggins is a faculty member in the Department of Political Science at the University of Central Oklahoma and teaches courses in international relations, public policy, technology, and American government. He is also a member of the American Political Science Association and the International Studies Association. Please welcome Dr. Brian Kiggins. Thank you. To my far right, your far left here, is Dr. Matthew Despain. He is a professor of history and the director of our Native American Studies program here at Rose State College. Before joining the Rose State faculty, Dr. Despain taught at the University of Oklahoma in both the Native American Studies program and in the Department of History. Dr. Despain's interests cover both Native American Studies and History disciplines and includes courses in the American West, American Indian History, the American Southwest, Federal Indian Policy and Sovereignty, Native American Philosophy, Introduction to Native American Studies, Oklahoma History, and Oklahoma Tribal Histories. Dr. Despain's research interests include the American fur trade, cross-cultural violence in the West, Indian mascots and stereotypes, Native Americans in American popular culture, Native American forest fighters, I'm gonna see if I can pronounce this correctly, Peñolos, did I say Peñolos. Peñolos, all right which, if you don't know, there are Hawaiian, Hawaiian cowboys. Hawaiian right? cowboys, yes. Yeah. Uh, Oklahoma environmental history, Chickasaw history, and the history of the Oklahoma City Zoo. Uh, Dr. Despain was the founding editor of Native Matters, the Journal of Native American Studies, which is published by the University of Oklahoma, and he is the former editor of the Chickasaw Nation's Journal of Chickasaw History and Culture. He also works with the Museum of the Mountain Man and the Journal of the Rocky Mountain Fur Trade, and Dr. Despain's publications included Fur Trappers and Traders of the Far Southwest, and numerous articles on Native American history and culture, the American West, the American fur trade, and Oklahoma history. And when he's not teaching That's about good. history, he can sometimes be found playing the bagpipes out on campus every now and then. Sorry yes. about that. Yeah, so uh, maybe you'll catch him one day. Please welcome Dr. Matthew to Spain. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to hand it over to you guys now. I've said my piece, at least for the moment and we will uh, move on from there so who would like to jump out here wow who, who to start right I, you oh okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no I'll go I'll go okay so you know James did kind of send us a preview of what he was going to say and I was pulling through each one of these and thinking Okay, I could really talk the whole, and some of my students who are here know this, um, I could talk this whole time period over this one topic, right? And really what we're looking at is kind of measurements on, on the wealth expansion and, and looking at social measurements as a, as a way to, to examine this. And so there was a few things that really stuck out on me. Um, you're talking about the $3 a day. And so we're looking at that from, be, from 1800, and part of me goes, how can we compare 2018 to 1800 with these numbers as far as our society is based on a total different structure? In a way, at that point, you know, we were basically a um, production for use society. In fact, that most families were producing and using what they needed in a way. I cannot live on $300 a day because I'm in the workforce. I am working for a wage instead of producing something that my family is going to use. And we look at things like the, um, the food as a proportion of our disposable income has decreased. And that's true, but our amount of disposable income has also decreased. Right? So as a family, um, you know, we have a, two, a dual earner household with two children, and it costs me $20,000 a year to put them in childcare. Well, when you look at how much I earn, that takes a significant portion. Then you factor in things like now most families have two car payments. 
we have to factor in all the extra expenses that it costs for our daily lives. And um, that eats away at that. And so our disposable income overall is, is much lower than it used to be. When we talk about standard of living, and one of the things that I wanted to do to prepare for this is actually look up how do we define standard of living? Because um, to me, that's a really big question. And so one of the things when I was looking this up that I got was it was talking about the materials and the wealth that are available to people in society. And so one of the things that I always like to point out when we're having these discussions is there's access to services. There's access to material comfort, education, housing. But theoretically having access to something and being able to get an education, being able to purchase a home, those are very different things. So whether we're talking about theoretical access or actual equality of results, is something that I think that we have to measure differently. And I think what we're really talking about is it's great. We live in 2018. Everybody has access to education, just like. Or do we? Well, no, I think we have access as far as technically we are an open access institution. Anybody who comes here can come if you can afford to pay or, or qualify for loans, something like that. And so my question would be, or my comment would be, that access to something is theoretically different than actually being able to follow through with it. And in a lot of ways, we've created more barriers, I think, um, in, in that area. I also think that lumping us all together and not taking um, aware demographic differences as far as gender, race, um, even, in the, even in our society, something like religious background, not factoring those things in is doing a great disservice to what we're going on. Um, I also wanted to talk about the life expectancy that James mentioned. And um, I know in our notes that we said the life expectancy in 2018 is 79. Well, that's true for high income countries. But if we're looking at a global context for low income countries, it's actually 62. So there is a big difference, um, you know, and yes, we are in an area where we don't have as high of poverty levels, especially absolute poverty as other places do, but we do have food deserts, right? We do have social class issues that come into the basic necessities and we do have absolute poverty um, in our state, in our country, in our society. And so part of my thing when I always caution people to make these comparisons is I really like when James ended, he said, the purpose of this should be if we made progress, that's great. Let's now take and see how we can expand that. And I, I would agree with him in every way, but I would also say caution yourself because a lot of times what happens is we fall back into comfort on our progress. Well, we're better off than we were 50 years ago. so. You got that going for you, right? And, and we kind of use that as a justification to allow the same processes to hold us back or allow a further development. And so I kind of see it as more of a cautionary tale than a let's pat ourselves on the back tale. So I'm going to let somebody else talk now. Awesome. But I can keep going if anybody wants to. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Who's running or? Oh, I have no preference. All right. Um, you know, when I'm just thinking about this, I, I tend to go to things that I'm more familiar with. And so, um, you know, I, I, I was listening to James. I was reading things that are, and of course, I've got red flags going up in my mind the whole time. Um, and, and of course, this, this uh, becomes more equated with, with my background with Native America. Um, side story, though I am, I'm white to the core, uh, I am the sole uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon in an indigenous family, so the entire I, I'm again I'm the lone white guy, the token white guy in my family. Uh, my wife grew up on reservation. Uh, you know, all my in-laws and stuff are, are reservation people. So my mind goes to, or my my when I start to measure these kind of things, that's where I want to go. 
and, and really uh, address the gross inequalities where this idea of, oh, life is better is not better by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, we want to think about an American dream. Why don't we flip that narrative? If, if what we're presenting is material wealth, and that's somehow that's the soul of, uh, of our well-being, is this, I can get a burger, I can access this, you know, if materialism defines me, uh, let's go ahead and find an American nightmare. And we could find that maybe in an inner city. We could look at Flint, Michigan. I'm going to go to a reservation. And so I look at those equations where we have unemployment in the area of 60 to 80 percent. We have, let's say, Pine Ridge Agency or Standing Rock Agency, place like that. N things are not too far different in, in, some, in some categories in Navajo land or, Dine or the world of the Diné. Um, so incredible uh, unemployment. The, the, the mean income on that reservation, say uh, Pine Ridge, is around $3,000 a year. 3000 that's the average income, right? So now you start breaking that into food and health care. Well, and is there health care? Literally none at all, even though Indian Health Service provides that. It, you have doctors that show up maybe once every three weeks to the, uh, to the, um, uh, uh, to the hospital, which is completely understaffed. Uh, there are no resources. You are so isolated that you cannot travel to get an education. So the idea of access to education really is prohibitive, right? highest suicide rates, highest alcohol rates uh, in the nation. So then my question becomes, right, uh, is this the American dream or is this the American nightmare, right? And I'm going to flip to the nightmare side. And so these ideas that are we better off? No, we're not, um, especially for indigenous people who once possessed this entire continent, who had access to all the resources, and they had freedom, they had political sovereignty, uh, they had better health, they lived longer, Right, and now because of what we're talking about here, what we we'll call colonialism, settler colonialism, the intrusion of the industrial strait upon those worlds, where we have pushed those people to the peripheries, uh, placed them on little uh, postage stamps of land, and said, "You survive there." Right, we've pr we've practiced ethnocide, we've practiced genocide, and we've done all these things. And what's happened is the majority or a good portion of the other population who's benefiting from all this wealth and materialism, yeah, they're living high on the hog and they're doing well, and, but at the expense of other peoples who continue to, to have to deal with the historical trauma of displacement and conquest. And so that's where I, I have to look at that. I have to understand it's not going well. Okay, oh, oh wait, 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 but you've got a double wide. You're doing great. You've got a double wide on the reservation, right? Yeah, you patch it up with a little bit of, uh, of, of newspaper here and some shingles here, but it's, it's a heck of a lot better than your teepee that you had 150 years ago. Oh, and you got a car, right, but it, we call it a res car. If you've ever seen a res car, things fall apart, start it with a screwdriver, hold it together with duct tape, but it's better than your pony, right? These kind of measures, I think, are, are unfair, right? And that's why I'm, 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 I'm on the other side of the <laughs> pendulum swing. I'm like going, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, and these are all byproducts of, of, um, of first an industrial revolution. You talk about technologies and innovation, right? Awesome, innovation. But let's think of what those innovations have done. The steam engine was the, was the entry vehicle for the invasion into the indigenous world. It was those technologies that benefited the conquerors, not the conquered, right? Um, uh, whatever it was, those things were always a detriment. Native Americans have not really benefited that much. Well, I think in the grand scheme of things, uh, they've lost, again, their language, they've lost their culture, they've lost their histories, they've lost their lands, they've lost their resources, and many of them now remain in, in, these, in an impoverished state. They are. If you ever want to go see um, a third world country in the midst of this basket of, this American basket of, of prosperity, take a trip up to Pine Ridge. Take a trip up to, um, to Standing Rock, and you'll have a come to Jesus moment about what the American dream is about or what the American process has been about. So I throw that out to us to mull over. We may have some points of counter, but let's, uh, that's let's kind of my stand on it, right? Oh, there, I'll put that out there. That makes us think <laughs> it's not all peaches and cream, right? And Big Macs and Chevys. I like peaches and cream, especially <laughs> Bluebell. <laughs> Bluebell ice cream, best ice cream, yeah? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, you You're kind of Brahms. I'm Ben and Jerry's. Yeah. I'm not. I don't know. I'm, I, I mean, Brahms is not bad, but <laughs> but I got to tell you, I, I, I'm a Bluebell snob, I guess. <laughs> um, 
I think there's some excellent uh, comments. Uh, you know, James offers a, a very uh, compelling uh, case. And I think that uh, what's interesting about um, uh, what uh, Professor Hall had to say uh, was that she, she really in many ways hit, I think, one of the um, sort of soft underbellies of James's argument. And this is sort of one of the features of making any kind of argument or claim in the social sciences. There's never sort of the, the perfectly logical or empirically supported uh, argument. Um, while it's true, um, small t, you know, uh, maybe not universally applicable. So, so let me say, while it's sort of accurate to suggest that uh, on, the, on an average basis, yes, humanity is wealthier and better off on an average basis. Averages are sort of the, a big, huge category that talks about an entire population size, right? So you're going to have hundreds, of thousands, hundreds or thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of observations in your data set, right? Don't, you, don't let your eyes roll back when I said data set, okay? It just, just means, you know, a fancy term, it just means the number of total observations that you, you, uh, um, uh, <coughs> that you uh, happen to uh, have access to. The, the challenge with average measurements is that it does not often, and this is the points of my colleagues here, uh, uh, Professor um, uh, Despain and Professor Hall have, have noted, it, it fails to capture some of the sort of micro patterns, some of the smaller patterns in smaller sets of your observations, smaller groups of people that perhaps don't fully participate in the kind of wealth that has been generated in the last two or 300 years of rapid, uh, and I'm gonna qualify this, technological innovation. And I'm gonna qualify it only because I'm sort of predisposed to, based on my research interests, to sort of focus on technology. Um, and it's these distributional effects. Now don't think socialism, all right? Um, this is not, you know, uh, distribution effects, it, or can occur in a, in a so-called free market capitalist uh, economy. Because you have to understand that government sets the rules by which the market functions. The idea of a self-regulating free market is a utopia. There's no such thing, not in the historical record, anywhere. Government sets the rules by which the markets function. Government set the weights by which we measure quantity Government sets standards of quality for products. Government mandates the number of hours that workers can work. Who qualifies as a worker? I, mean, I don't know anyone here, but I didn't have to experience child labor. Well, I don't know, that depends. If you guys knew my dad, you, you might <laughs> disagree with that. But you know, I didn't have to experience child labor that was sort of a, an, an important feature of 19th century market capitalism. You have to understand that if a government doesn't set a rule, the government has set a rule. The rule is government doesn't regulate in this part of an economy. Government sets the rules by which the market functions. And rules, this is the point that I was building up to, rules that government sets by which the market functions have distributive effects. Rules that government set by which the market functions benefit some and benefit others less. Give you an idea, for example. Um, the bottom 99.999 percent of income earners here in the United States since the 1950s had, uh, until 1980, had experienced about 2 percent income growth per year. In 1980, that changed because the rules by which the market function began to change in the United States. What's happened is that the rate of income growth, particularly down at the bottom end of the income spectrum, has turned negative. Negative. In 1978, a butcher was making $28,800 a year. Now, they make about $16,600 a year. That's in inflation-adjusted dollars. 
the rules by the which the market functions changed in the United States. And as a result, we have different distributional effects. All that income that was earned pre-1980 at the bottom end of the spectrum has simply been shifted up to the point zero zero one percent of income earners, the so-called job creators in the United States. <clears throat> this is an example of innovation in a different way. It's public policy innovation. Which brings me to sort of my overarching point, that innovation is not equal. Some innovation we welcome. Other innovations, not so much. Like the innovation of different types of government rules by which the market functions that create a maldistribution of income in our economy, for example. <clears throat> that make people more poor at the bottom end of the spectrum and people more rich at the very, 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 very top end of the spectrum. Now, this is, this, uh, this, uh, dis these distributional effects are not just limited to um, the national level of politics. In global politics, really sort of my realm of, sort of, of, of investigation, um, we can observe distributional effects uh, by using the measure of per capita GDP. That's simply just taking the total value of all goods and services produced during a one-year period in a nation and dividing it by the total size of that nation's population. In 2017, for example, U.S. per capita GDP was 59,500. This is according to the CIA World Factbook. Now I got to tell you, the CIA World Factbook is absolutely awesome. You guys are writing papers, you need some quick stats on something, go to the CIA World Factbook. It's, it's fantastic. U.S. per capita GDP at that number, at that uh, level, ranked 20th in the world. China, by comparison, uh, has a per capita GDP of $16,600. In 2017, that's good for 106th in the world. The 229th ranked country, the country dead last, was the Central Africa Republic. $700 a year per capita GDP. And by the way, if you go to the list of countries that are ranked on the CIA World Fact, ba World Fact Booked webpage, you'll note that the bottom 10 or 15 countries are all sub-Saharan countries, save one or two exceptions. So in terms of the total income produced on an annual basis in the global economy, that income is distributed disproportionately among nation states. Industrialized Western democracies get the lion's share of that new income generated each year. Whereas countries in other parts of the world, they get smaller shares. Now that's just sort of, sort of the income distributional effects of innovation, all right? Let's talk about technology innovation. Forgive me if I'm taking going too long. No? Okay. no? Okay. You got some time. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about the development of nuclear technology. Pretty zero in terms of its emissions of greenhouse gases. Zero emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, can produce electricity for us. That's a good thing. Um, but nuclear power, of course, presents us with other risks, other trade-offs that we have to be willing to bear. And this is what is unique about innovation. Any innovation that we produce can be used or applied for what we might call good or bad objectives. A knife can be used to spread butter and jam on a, on a piece of bread, or it can be used to commit an act of violence. Nuclear power, of course, offers us the opportunity to build nuclear weapons, 
the most destructive type of weapon we've ever developed in the human ever developed in recorded human history. Social media technology. All of us these days are creatures of social media technology. We had a bit of a rude awakening about some of the bad ways in which social media technology can be utilized in the 2016 presidential election. And whether you support Trump or don't support Trump, whether you, you think it's not a big deal that Russia meddled in our election, let me tell you something. I don't care what your political affiliation is. It doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that the information upon which we voters rely upon to make informed, reasoned decisions about whom to vote for is now less reliable. It doesn't matter whether or not you supported Trump or didn't support Trump. What matters is that the very core, the heart of democracy, is now vulnerable to direct attack and subversion and manipulation. Our freedom to choose who we want to govern ourselves is no longer available, you understand, because it's a function of the accuracy of the information that we have available to us. Now, let's get me to this, this other point. Artificial intelligence and robots. The Department of Labor, U.S. government, uh, during the Bush administration, uh, initiated a uh, five-year study beginning in 2007, going through uh, and overlapping into uh, the Obama administration in 2012 on uh, the potential effects of robots replacing uh, labor, uh, human labor, in the United States economy. The uh, study was a bit conservative in its projections, suggesting that no more than maybe about 30 or 40 percent of U.S jobs currently occupied by human beings would be lost by 2030 to automated technologies. Other uh, economists, a couple of MIT economists, um, Brynjolfsson, say that uh, three times fast, and uh, McAfee published a book a couple years ago in which they have projected upwards of 90 percent, uh, they've given us a range of somewhere between 70 percent to 90 percent of jobs currently performed by human beings will be fully automated by 2030, which means that we have, on a conservative side, 30% of jobs lost to robots, and on the more aggressive side, up to 90% of jobs lost to robots. Our entire economy right now is based on earning a wage. We fund our political system, our national defense, our local police forces, based entirely on wages made by workers. What's going to happen when robots have replaced humans and there are no wages for humans to make? Some might suggest, well, that the innovation, innovative potential of our economy has demonstrated throughout history that we'll just innovate new roles and jobs for human beings. But artificial intelligence technology is such that there is not any activity currently performed by humans, even our creative activities like making music or art, that cannot be performed as well as, if not better than, human beings. Artificial intelligence controlled robots don't take breaks, don't get sick. See where I'm going with this? It's cheaper, in other words, than employing you. Now, we may end up with an apocalypse, robot apocalypse, right, like the Terminator movies. I don't know. Who knows? If it includes a, a ray gun or a lightsaber, I think I'd be, oh, I'd be cool with that. But um, we may also end up in a position where we now have abundance. Two possible scenarios that may evolve, develop out of our innovative technology advancements um, coming down the, the sort of the pike in the near future. It may be possible for us to experience abundance where less than 10% right now are in living on less than two, uh, uh, are in extreme poverty, living on less than $2 a day. 
And in 15 years, we could have the potential to perhaps completely eradicate poverty on planet Earth. Assuming climate change doesn't kick in like crazy and, you know, flood everything out. But, of course, who knows, right? It's climate change isn't real. Isn't, isn't that right? Isn't that what we're told? Um, <clears throat> all this goes to sort of support my point that innovation is not equal. It creates very distinct um, distributional effects that can be affected by the type of rules government implements now to benefit certain constituencies in the future. With regard to the use of artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence robots, the rules that government sets today will have wide effects, wide reaching effects on the distribution of wealth generated through artificial intelligence and robot technologies going forward. And who gets to benefit disproportionately from that wealth and income generated? My last uh, point here, also related to the development of uh, robots, is this idea of slaughter bots. Anyone seen a YouTube video on slaughter bots at all? No? It's only about seven minutes long. I suggest if you haven't, maybe you, you, you might take a look at it. Future war will be won by whichever country or non-state actor, corporation, terrorist group, has the best artificial intelligence technology. We're not going to be able to keep artificial intelligence algorithms secret. They're going to get leaked on the internet. It's going to happen. Every country is going to have access to it. All you got to do is take a little drone, put about four or five grams of explosives on it, okay? And with the use of facial recognition software or, or programs with an artificial intelligence, you can assign and, and uh, 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 programs that identify what a person is wearing, what their behavior is, et cetera, et cetera. The use of this kind of analysis, you can assign a dozen drones to go after one person. And those drones aren't going to cost you maybe then a 500 bucks to $1,000 to produce. The cost of war, in other words, is radically decreasing because of automated technologies. And the prohibitions against war, particularly for democracies, where the vote works against political elites advocating for war because they feel the brunt of a war gone south at the ballot box, you understand? That prohibition where you no longer have human beings on the front lines reduces the barriers to go to war. And so we may end up with something kind of in between apocalypse and abundance where there's more or less just perpetual war almost fought on a day-to-day -day basis. And understand that the battle space won't be confined to where your armies of robots are located. Because of information technology, and all of us have these little devices right here, all of them with GPS trackers in there, okay? The battle space will be everywhere simultaneously. Welcome to tomorrow. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go home and crawl under my bed now. <laughs> uh, Mission yeah, accomplished. That's why I'm going off the grid. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, uh, for me, uh, I mean, a lot of this comes, you know, and I, and I, can, I can see this without, any, without too much problem. Um, but, but as we're creating the foundations for that future of tomorrow, right, I think part of what we've got to recognize is that this sense of, we started off with this innovation innovation in this material wealth and, and who's benefiting from this and who's growing rich from it, right, that we have skewed the concepts of democracy where we would develop concepts and rules that would regulate and, and try to re, re, regress that, or not regress it, but, or, but control it. And I think we've gotten to a point uh, in many ways where we've got to be cautious that we've lost what it means to be in a democratic society. We have become one where we put, where, where the powers that be, uh, corporate, um, 
we're, we're in an age of what we would call um, um, casino capitalism, right? Where, where those that are in charge aren't even producing anything. They're, they're extracting their wealth off of investments and things of this nature. And you gave some indications about what that poverty and that, that, that income levels are. Well, we're talking about what, I, I want to think, help me out on this. I want to think it's about the top 10% of the, I think I'm talking in just the United States, top 10 percent of the of the nation controls at least 50 percent of the income, or maybe maybe I'm even giving more credit where credit's due. The top one percent controls 1%. Is over 70 percent. Over 70 percent. So yeah. My stuff of is new, looking of new income generated on an annual basis, and that's important. It's new income generated. Right. So at that point, we're talking about let's talk about the, the pie. We're all sitting at the table with that pie, and we've got uh, two or three people are just hogging it up, and we're we're grappling for the uh, for the crumbs and all that. Well, they are the ones that, if you haven't figured it out, uh, for my opinion, right, are, are pulling a lot of the strings within government. They are the ones that are setting a lot of the rules that we have to live by, the ones that we either succeed or we don't, right? And that's part of the problem is that, uh, is that casino capitalism. I, so I don't know how, to, how, how do you deal with that. Other than one of the things that I think that's happened there, and I'm kind of st stumbling along in this a little bit, but what I think that things that's happened is that we have put so much stock in the material wealth, in the consumer culture. We have become a consumer society. That's what defines us. My house, my car, we have lost a sense of deeper identity. It's all superficial, and but that seems to be what drives us, right? We think about uh, we think about popular culture. We think about advertisement, which tells us what we've got to buy and got to do, and who we are and what we need to be. And we're all geared to that, and it's all a process that feeds and supports this top percent. We don't even realize it, but we are their engines of success, right? And they're preying upon us. Um, and in the process, we have lost, and this is my feeling, we have lost a sense of civic duty. Now, I don't even think that we teach civics in our high schools anymore. Do you guys get civics? What it means to be a citizen, uh, 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 to, to engage in a democracy? See, we're, we now have equated the idea of democracy with, with free capitalism. We've almost said that that's democracy when there's so many other components to being part of a democratic society. That's being responsible. So we, uh, and again, I'm digressing a little bit. We've become a society that is so driven by it's my right. It's my right to exploit. It's my right to go ahead and, and profit. It's my right to this. We have failed to be a society of responsibility. Now, if you can go ahead and replace one R for the other R, then we can understand that there's a different meaning of democracy. Where we work in a society, we work as a commonwealth so that the small echelon doesn't gain all this financial power, all this political power, and gets the robots to do all their dirty work in the end, right? Um, you know, where you may have a student activist movement come out, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna stand up, we're gonna, no, let's get the bots out, let's go ahead and get rid of those images because they're speaking against what we want, right? Don't think that that can't happen. Don't think that it already doesn't happen. Don't think you get a march on Wall Street going, hey, 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 we're, we're tired of the World Bank, we're tired of this exploitation, we want our voice heard, and what does the establishment do? calls out the police, moves people on out. We don't want to hear your voice. We don't want to hear what you have to say about a true egalitarian or, equal, or a society of democracy, right? So we're already in it. We're already into it deep. But that's the byproduct of, of casino capitalism, right? And it's all around us. Um, but think about the trickle-down effect. The trickle-down effect is this, is that you are becoming a dumbed-down society. It's reality. You think, well, wait a minute. I'm going to college. I'm going to university. Don't think that education has been dumbed down for you. Uh, Paulo Freire, who used to talk about the idea of critical analysis, critical reading, make you know, uh, we're not teaching you guys how to do that anymore. We're teaching you how to be automatrons, right? You get through the high school, you go through the high school setting. Uh, don't think critically. Don't think analytically. Here's your test questions. Here's your test answers because you have to you have to be measured. You have to be measured precisely in order to, for production statistics at the education level. So we've removed that freedom of education and we're moving you down these little avenues and it's feeding you into a de-skilled, right, de-analytical, de-democratized society. You don't even realize it, right? And I, I hate to say sometimes I'm, I'm and I, I, have, I have to do that because I'm forced to do certain things, right? Um, be cautious of that. Be aware. Have your head on a swivel. Be understanding. You've got to develop that critical assessment. So don't go into your classrooms and sit there and just go, oh, preach to me. 
talk to me, Dr. Despain. Tell me what I need to know for my test so I can pass, so I can get my A, so I can get my degree, so I can get it in radiology because what we are going to know is that a robot's going to replace you in 10 or 15 years. Right? You need, to, you need to make sure that your education, whether it's at Rose or at OU or UCO or anyone, anyway, is one where you're developing a far more greater sense of civic responsibility, of intellectual freedom. I don't know if that's going to help in the inevitable outcome, but you need, to, you need to move beyond that. So I come back to it. Are we becoming a civic-minded society? I would say no. We are being driven by, i got to get the Porsche, I got to get the big house in Nichols Hills. I got to get the swimming pool. I got to get the trophy wife or the trophy partner or whatever it is. We've got all these things that have been projected to us on the screen, on our iPhones, on the billboard going down the street as to who we should be. And we should begin to question if that's reality or the reality of who we are or our identity and maybe ask if there's something else. Maybe I didn't even talk about mixed reality. Yeah. Um, so, so, uh, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it. Okay, right, right. right. Uh, so, so here I am. I was thinking about this. I talked about this. And has anybody ever heard of Mario Savio? Okay, Mario Savio was one of the uh, the vocal leaders of the student free speech movement at the University of Berkeley in 1964, where he, where students were pushing against the establishment, that being the the University of, uh, of California at Berkeley against the repression of free speech, the repression of free thought and things of this nature. And I love his saying. He says, there is a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you have to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels and upon the levers, upon all the apparatus that you've got to make it stop. You've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. He goes on to say, the futures and the careers for which American students now prepare are, for the most part, intellectual and moral wastelands. And this is back in the 60s, right? This chrome-plated consumer's, uh, consumer's paradise would have us grow up to be well-behaved children, but an important minority of men and women coming to the front today have shown they will die rather to be standardized, replaceable, and irrelevant. And this is 1964. Um, he also would say the university has become a factory. Look, I'm a, I'm a teacher at a, at a college, at a university. Um, you, but you as students have to be active agents in your education. You have to understand and develop that civic mindedness, right? Otherwise, the odiousness of the machine will assert its dominion over you, right? And I hope that in your processes of coming and getting education, you think beyond how do I get past this exam? How do I get through this chapter? How do I get my A? Because that's what we're driven at. The target is the A. I've got to get the A. got to get the A. That's what I'm worried about. Not about learning to be critical thinkers or, or what have you. you. You're driven by that because that's what society says you ought to get. Right? Um, but in that, like I said, I come back, develop that, that civic mindedness. A de true democracy is built upon a population that serves one another, that helps one another, and does not sit there to exploit the other to the detriment. Right, but that's kind of where we're at. Now I got a big soapbox and that's probably preach something that is an unintentable, but uh, but there we go. But right. I think we come up with another panel topic, maybe, right? Um, <laughs> Mario Savio. I'm always looking for panel always. topics. Right? <laughs> but it, it did make me think of something. You know, we talk about the individualistic nature of our culture and yep. how that drives materialism and the cult, the comfort and. But one of the things that I often think about, it's kind of twofold. So one is we use material comfort to, to kind of measure the wealth and things like that. But it also makes me think of my hometown. If anybody doesn't know me, I'm from Lawton, Lawton, okay? And so there are two things that drive Lawton, and that's Fort Sill and that's Goodyear. And if you don't work at Fort Sill or Goodyear, you work at the gas stations. That's about it, right? Um, but we go down there to visit and we see all these people have brand new houses and they have big trucks and boats and four wheelers and I'm looking at my husband going, how? Okay, I'm a, I'm a college professor. He works in an oil and gas company. We're just trying to like, you know, get by every month with a little and the, and so I'm going, how do they afford all this? And finally he looked at me and he said, I'll paraphrase, they're up to their eyeballs in debt. Yeah. 
And they are, right? And, and so one of the things that I often think about is if they have convinced us that to get the measures for wealth and success and achievement, we now need to owe them and go into debt with those at the top of the distribution in order to achieve the, su the success markers that they put in place for us. So even something like the education that Matt's been talking about. So we, we all have these restraints on you can't have these jobs, you're not successful, you have to get the higher education. And again, it's not about the knowledge base that comes with that, it's about the marker that it's going to get you the job later on in your career. But then we have to get them into debt in order to get the job so you can pay back the student loan once you graduate from college. Oh my gosh, this is a wonderful scam. We were talking about that. <laughs> Did you know that the university, I'm sorry, uh, the university, or the California system back in the 60s and into the 70s was free. You could go and go to the University of San Diego, California, or UC Irvine, and basically it cost you almost nothing. How am I doing? It was tuition free. Tuition free. However, okay. There were fees okay. that you had to pay. Oh, okay. And even when I graduated from high school in the early 90s in, in California, uh, it was still tuition free, but your fees were going to be uh, about $12,000 a year. So. And, but that was in the 90s. I, yeah. I wonder what that was back in the 60s and 70s when they were really putting that forward. Yeah, right. But anyway, I know I got you up, but the yeah. idea is that great, easy accessibility. Mm -hmm. That, that great public education institution out of California and the product that it put out in terms of people, uh, innovative, you know, we're talking about activists, all sorts, you know, whatever it is. And now we are getting up to our eyeballs in debt, pale grants, you know, getting bank loans just to get that certificate. It's, it's a different world that you guys are. Even for me, I mean, I got out with just about $2,000 in debt. $2,000, right? Now, I did janitorial work, but I had the time to do that. I don't know where you guys are, but I just I shake my head I, I, about what you guys have to go through because the education has become a different consumer item. It I'm is. sorry, I intruded, but I no, want to no, I mean, and there. that's true. And so, if we look at it, you know, going back to the late '60s, early '70s, um, you know, for the average um, student, kind of in a uh, traditional student, meaning those late teen, early 20 years, not a family to support or anything like that, they can work a minimum wage job um, for an average of about 25 to 30 hours a week and be able to um, afford to live, essentially, pay the expenses, the tuition, things like that. Now, I challenge my students in my classes today to think about what they can afford on 20 to 30 hours a week of a minimum wage job, and most of them are going, maybe my car and I'd have to live in it right and and that's all that uh, that that they can afford and so we think about the challenges that are faced with this combination of I have to have the degree I have to go in debt to get the degree and then I have to get the good job to pay back the debt I got to get the degree to try to get the material success that the society tells me I need in order to prove that I am successful and wealthy all the time being in a state of debt peonage right so let me. Uh, I'm sorry, Kim, did you want to weigh in? Because I want I'm gonna, I'm gonna I take run about, something that's about uh, counter. When, when you're done, I'm going to take about five, maybe ten minutes to try to address everything that's been said here. <laughs> I'm going to throw you. Right. So, <laughs> uh, you know. so James, I'm going to throw you an underhanded softball uh -oh. pitch right here. Okay. okay? All right. <laughs> I'm going to scoot up because I, I want you guys to pay attention to this. All right. Inequality is necessary. Economic inequality is necessary as an economic incentive for there to be innovation. True. Oh. All I heard was sort of this <laughs> crashing glass sounds over here. No, 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 no. No, no. no, no. no, no. The fact of the matter is, is that I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic yeah. to both Professor, uh, Professor Hall and Professor Despain on this point, right? The issue is, isn't so much that um, we, that we should all be equal in terms of our income participation. The issue is how much inequality are we willing to tolerate in society? Because the fact of the matter is that the technology of the, of the uh, capitalist market uh, structure has done more, in my view, in the last 300 years to lift in human beings out of abject subsistence farming poverty 
than any other innovation we've ever come up with. That market, the market structure is absolutely powerful in its, in its capability to incentivize the kind of innovation and wealth generation from which we now benefit in today's society. Let me give you just a quick example. In 1929, here in the United States, the share of income of the top 1% of earners peaked at over 23.5%. In other words, of, all, of every dollar of new income generated in the U.S. economy, the top 1% income earners took 23 and a half, more than 23 and a half cents of every dollar. That was in 1929, a few months before the stock market crash of 1929. Okay? In 2007, the share of income of the top 1% in the United States again broke, uh, broke through the 23.5% level. What happened in 2007? 2008? What's that? Oh, yeah, right, right. There's another financial crisis. We had the worst recession that we've had since the Great Depression in the 1930s. We need to narrow inequality in terms of income inequality in the United States, but we cannot eliminate it because trying to eliminate it works against and undermines the innovation on which we have come to depend to generate the kind of wealth and technological accoutrements that we've become accustomed to in our modern economy. The way that the United States government limited income inequality during the 1950s, often referred to by those who say we need to have low government and low taxes and blah, 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 all this other gar garbage, was in fact a rather robust progressive tax system. The top tax rate in the 1950s never went below 70 percent. Let me say that again. The ta top tax rate in the 1950s never went below 70%. At one point, it was 90%. Now, to be fair, it was 90% and 70% of um, you know, any income generated past a certain threshold. The 90% uh, rate was set at $500,000 in 1950s dollars, right? That's, that's, <laughs> that's a few million in today's dollars, say the least, right? So after you know, $500,000, you paid 90% in income taxes. That was a little too high, though. It disincentivized uh, people from, from working. Once you got back down to 70%, there was still sufficient incentive for some of the top earners to continue working and generate more, more income, which was then taxed at 70%, and government revenues increased. But what we discovered in the 1950s economy was this kind of a tax system, is that all five income groups, so each sort of quintile of income groups in the United States, okay, all grew together, all more or less experienced the same rate of income growth across the board. It's just amazing, across the board. No income group earned had experienced income growth at a rate faster within a, a, a close range than others. But that changed in 1980. Well, about 1978, on and through. That changed. And what's happened since is as we have, have restructured our tax system, which means we have changed the rules by which the market functions, we now have our two lower income groups experiencing negative growth rates. These are people that are making less than $24,000 a year, okay? Our middle income groups, three and four, are more or less stagnant. They're, they're sort of keeping their nose above water, barely. Our top income group is experiencing, you know, okay income growth rates. But when you break down where all that income is really going and you look at sort of the top 10%, top 5%, top 3%, top 1%, you rapidly discover that it's, that it's the top 5% and top 1% earners. People that are making a minimum of $480,000 a year that are by far experiencing the most rapid growth in their incomes on an annual basis. $480,000 a year. To be in the top 1%, that's what you've got to make. We have set up rules in our current economy 
that work against political stability in a democracy. That creates resentment on the part of individuals who are working their tails off to support themselves with two earners and can't seem to do it. Because we have chosen to shift income up the income spectrum. And as a result, we will again see another financial crisis because our in, the income share of the top one percenters is just breaching 23% today, at least in 2017. We're close, it'll happen again. What, what that means is that you need to be careful about who you vote for. You need to get people into office that understand that our economy functions best when we implement government policies that narrow income inequality such that and implement government policies and rules that prevent income inequality from going above 23 and a half percent otherwise we're going to continue to experience the same kinds of economic crises that we experienced in 1929 and 2007 <laughs> All right. I want to make sure. Thank you. I'll, right. uh, I'll shut up. <laughs> no, that's good. All right. So I've got now four minutes to try to uh, to to. Um, oh, I thought we were going to three thirty. Well, we're going to let them ask some questions here. So we've oh, got to give them. Right. Some I forgot time. about that. Yeah. Uh, so okay. Sorry. So um, Professor Hall mentioned you know comparing uh, you know living in eighteen hundred to living in twenty eighteen. Uh, I'll start there because uh, I think that's a good point of. We don't live the same way, and uh, and yes, that's right, and we're better for it. How many of you regularly wear clothes that you had to spend time making yourself? How many of you do that? How many of you eat food that you regularly had to grow yourself? Or how many of you slaughter beef or pork that you had to grow yourselves? Anybody? No? Really? I, I imagine there'd be okay. some hundreds now, in the Matt, room. Matt, you don't count. All right. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm talking about you live off that, right? If you didn't have that, you would starve, right? Um, uh, you know, yes, life is much different, and we are better off for it because it is dramatically different. I don't have to spend countless hours and time doing basic things. Uh, when I can be more productive doing something else, right? Um, so we're, we are far better off for not having to spend time growing our own food, building our own homes, uh, all of these types of things. Um, and I'll mention, I mentioned, you know, starving. This is one of the interesting things that I have found. Um, we mentioned food deserts in the United States, but why do those stand out? Why do those stand out to us? What's that? Yes, they are so rare, right? In other words, in a, they are. They are. And let's let's go with this one step further. Find me a case in the United States today where someone literally starved to death because they could not access food, not because they were locked in a room and denied food, not because somebody used force or violence to prevent them from accessing food. Even in our measurements of hunger today, we have changed it. We don't talk about hunger so much. We talk about food insecurity, right? Why? Because it is so rare. What's one of the leading problems of those in lower income households, right? Obesity, right? So we see that uh, things are significantly better and the reason episodes of food deserts or whatnot stand out is because they're rare right yeah, they stand know. out to transferring from starvation to yeah. cardiovascular <laughs> problems and obesity and uh, and uh, diabetes is really good trade I mean I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with my Native American perspective here because they've been forced to eat a more Western diet of high carbohydrates and high sugars and high fats 
that the cancer rates, the yeah, the uh, the diabetes rates, all these things are skyrocketing on Native American reservations. So I'm going to argue counter to that that the the availability of food just because it food just doesn't mean that it's it's good food, right? And it and just because my belly's filled doesn't mean I'm going to die. Uh, I'm, I may not I may not die of starvation, but I'm going to die in ten years at an average age of 55, which is about what you are on a reservation. 55 to 60, that's when people on reservations start croaking, right? They're not living to the same because of that food disparity. There may be plenty that the government's dropping off the end of the truck as they ride, drive through the reservation. We call it commodity foods, but but, but, let's, again, but again, even, going even to the hospital their, because your heart's exploding and, and, and you're, you're, they got to chop your lower limbs off because you got diabetes problems. I don't and, know if that's a trade. And I want to point thing. out, we look at levels of obesity in the lower income populations, but it's not always a factor. It's primarily not a factor of overeating. It's the types of foods that are available. So they are more highly processed foods. It's what you can afford is, is much unhealthier for the body. Well, and it, so who can afford to go to McDonald's? McDonald's or to let's say or to Crest versus Whole Foods or you know what's that pricey shop across from uh, uh, from from uh, Chesapeake Sprouts. right Sprouts, Sprouts. right <laughs> you go in there right I go in there I'm like well, I can't even afford a slice of pizza right <laughs> I got to go over and get me a Taco Bell thing because that's a professor's income right I got to go get me two tacos for a buck versus you know, eating off that that pristine high high dollar, but even unprocessed food salad. Bar. Even and looking at I'm the Native just, American, you guys are hoarding it on my time now. No way, I, man. Okay, I'm but just that's saying. what we do. Uh, you know, <laughs> we're passionate. Even even the uh, in the Native American examples, not all tribes are in the same condition. Correct. I mean, if you look at the Chickasaw tribe of Oklahoma, uh, has the, they've been advantageous because of the I thirty five corridor. All right. So they have they have, but they have done quite a bit to develop that themselves, right? I mean, I-35 was here for a lot longer than what they've been able to take advantage of it, per se. Right, uh, and they gave self-determination, right. self able to go ahead and right. use that. And so, yeah. so you see that even, even in, in certain uh, tribal areas that they are able to emerge and take advantage of what's available. Uh, and this I'm going to come back because uh, I know Dr. Kiggins gave us this apocalyptic vision of the future where uh, somebody's going to use their iPhone to drop a droid on your head and uh, a drone on your head and, and, and eliminate you uh, and now I'm going to be looking over my shoulder every day uh, after that but uh, um, historically I'm going to fall back I'm just going to fall back on historically it is true that um, innovations spur new types of occupations new types of things now he may be right he may be right that artificial intelligence is a game changer, right? Uh, but historically, that has not been the case. And so have we admitted a new technology that's going to change uh, the nature of how we interact? I'm not convinced, right? I'm not convinced. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of folks within that field who are not convinced that at least now or even in the next 30 years, artificial intelligence will be prepared to take that kind of, of role uh, from us. So I'm not, I'm not convinced of the starker thing. I'm convinced that history tends, will tend to play out as it has, which is at the end of that innovation, we will all be better off than we were before it in some form or fashion. Uh, maybe because we won't all be living off wages. Who knows? Abundance right? or apocalypse. So, so right. you might have uh, some other mechanism, right? Or uh, maybe uh, having to work for income becomes a little bit different, uh, maybe not as, as required. So uh, there, are, there are ways that we can look at that. But at the end of the day, as I mentioned in my opening comments, and I agree with, with Dr. Kiggins, this, this growth has not been equal, uh, and it cannot be. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have one thing to offer, right? Um, I could be, if I owned it, right, and I sold, if I owned a home, just a modest home in San Francisco, and sold it this year, I could be in the top 1% of income earners for that year, right? Would I be in the top 1% the following year and the year after that? Probably not, right? Uh, it's not just about the you know the accumulation of, of wealth to a group these these groups aren't the same right 
Uh, again, uh, we have significant income mobility across the spectrum, uh, which I mentioned in the, in the previous panel. I won't repeat all of that again, but uh, significant mobility. Uh, and so uh, even while we have this, this inequality in growth, I'm going to fall back on, would you rather be poor in 1950? Yeah, we had high tax rates and more equal growth, but I'm going to argue you're way better off being poor in 2018 than you are being poor in 1950. Uh, you're way better off being poor in 2018 than you were in 1850 for sure. All right? And we could go back farther than that. The growth has not been equal. There can be no doubt about that. Uh, Making it more equal can happen on, in a couple of directions, right? You can also lower barriers, such as was discussed in the last one, to entry into market activity, make it easier for people uh, to engage in market activity and to become employed and to become entrepreneurs themselves. Uh, so uh, there, there's more than one way, in, a, in other words, to accomplish a more equal distribution, if that's what you're after. Um, but, but to, to acknowledge that there are pockets where this growth has not been equal or where others are not doing as well uh, really proves the point that where we're at today is significantly better than where we've ever been before as a whole, right? Uh, and we don't like using averages and we don't like ignoring others, but as a whole, we are significantly better off. You are for sure. One thing I'll end on here, and then we'll open this up for questions, is this fact. Today, it is easier for any one of you to develop skills and acquire the skills to have a very productive and a very wealthy in the to total sense, not just income or, or possessions, but a wealthy lifestyle than it has been for anybody in recorded history. Uh, and you don't need to spend seven or eight years in college to do it. Uh, and so I'm going to leave you with that. I'm going to open this up to uh, anyone who has questions, who wants to grill any of us on, uh, on our comments. So uh, if you have a question, come up to the mic and we will do it. And I'm going to check my phone to see if we have any questions from our online folks. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. I don't know your name. Kiggins. Dr. Just call me yeah, Ryan. My first name is Ryan. It's okay. okay. Uh, the first thing I heard you say was that it's that for sure robots can replace everything humans do, and that's just not true. That's a very current philosophical debate. They have they're doing tests constantly. No one, and the, you said also that all these things for sure what will be happening with robots, and it's only speculation because it's not happening right now. Okay, those are some pretty um, direct comments, and I appreciate you raising those those uh, issues. Um, so, in 1983, the federal government engineered a bailout of the U.S. automotive industry, um, one of many that the U.S. automotive industry has experienced over the last uh, several decades. The bailout was, uh, part of the bailout was a package of loan guarantees that the um, um, big three automakers could use to, as they put it, retool their factories. At the time, the cost to produce a car in the United States was significantly higher than, than it was to produce a car in Japan. In part, it had to do with sort of the uh, number of hours that the average Japanese worker was willing to work. Uh, but it also had to do with the degree of technological innovation that Japanese auto plants had compared to U.S. auto plants of the era. What the big three automakers did is they brought in automated robots, robotic welders, that replaced workers in U.S. plants, automotive plants. And what we have actually experienced as a result of that uh, shift toward robotic technology in the 1980s is we have experienced a decrease in the number of employees working or number of workers 
employed by U.S. automotive makers. We've already began to experience robots replacing human workers. It's not a question of if it's going to happen. It's a question of how soon it's going to happen and, and how many additional positions will be replaced. You don't even have to go to a lawyer these days to get legal advice. You can go to LegalZoom.com or Rocket Lawyer and rely on the artificial intelligence algorithm specifically designed to assist you as you work through those websites offerings of legal advice. How many of you use TurboTax to do your taxes? Algorithm, artificial intelligence algorithm, replaced accountants. It's already happening. Again, the question is how much, right? Do we use drones in our US military forces? Are they piloted by human beings? They are from distance, but they also have the capability of being fully autonomous when they take off and land and go to site. As a matter of fact, the human pilots of our drones only actively take over, quote unquote take over, when they're assessing whether or not to fire upon potential enemies on the ground. Otherwise, that drone is fully autonomous. It's already happening. And you think about what's going on in the aircraft industry. I mean, mm -hmm. that idea of having a skilled pilot and a co-pilot between the steer, be, stick on a 747, those guys really We've had autopilot do nothing much to sleep in the cockpit. It will be a short time before those triple-digit, yeah. I mean, those six-figure, right. six I can't get the word figure. off it, figure uh, incomes will be replaced by, because we've got, we've got the capacity to land and fly and take those airplanes. Uber right now is testing driverless semi-trucks in the Phoenix metro area for delivery. Pretty soon you might not even need to come to a campus Amazon. to enjoy a class by one of our colleagues here. But thank you for your question. Appreciate it. Uh, we need to, to, we have another one that I think is up. I got a few things to say. I really liked uh, your analysis, and uh, I kept framing it in my mind as were the pyramids worth it, kind of, you know, because you kept saying how uh, who benefits from these innovations and whatnot. And to uh, Ryan, uh, I heard you preface what you said with "Don't worry, it's not socialism," and I kind of feel we need to destigmatize that word. I agree. Because um, like, there's two different types of socialism. There's the social welfare, and then there's you know multiple types. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's a wide, wide umbrella. And then there's a uh, democracy in the workplace, which is right. what I'm interested in. And I believe the AI crisis, and another thing with the AI is there's AI writing newspaper articles and people can't even tell the difference, right? But uh, I believe if people, if workers had more say in their workplace, because uh, as a sci-fi sci fan, I keep thinking of automation. I'm like, why wouldn't this make life more luxurious? Would it be feared as a job killer as much if workers had more say in the workplace? Interesting question. Are you asking me or are you asking my other Well, I'm just, uh, you, I guess, sure. <laughs> and uh, also on the socialism uh, interpreted as welfare, where would we be without the uh, subsidies and bailouts of corporate welfare you know, well, in terms yeah. of innovation? Well, the fact of the matter is, is we live in a corporate welfare state. Let's, let's be frank. Um, that being said, uh, this is, you post some interesting questions. Uh, would a more democratic set of rules that promote uh, more employee input in the workplace um, um, have a more positive effect on limiting the sort of uh, nastier effects that I described as potentially occurring or are occurring with the adoption of automated technologies in the workplace. Um, yes, because workers have an incentive not to allow robots into the factory or into the workplace, right? On the other hand, um, workers have an incentive to let robots into the workplace that enhance human labor productivity the more units that we can produce per hour, the more valuable we are to our employer. And if robots or automated technologies are going to assist us in doing that, then uh, certainly we, we uh, have the grounds for, for employers, um, or we have proper incentive, we, I should say we have incentives for employers to keep human beings employed. Um, I'm just not sure that 
democracy in the workplace necessarily works well with um, innovation. I'd have to give that some more thought, but it's, it's a provocative thought. Uh, my suspicion is that it wouldn't necessarily alter the potential of innovation. It would just alter the process by which we innovate in the workplace. I mean, a lot of innovation does come from the public sector, but I was also uh, wondering uh, that what I was getting at with that would, would be, wouldn't we just reduce our work hours overall? Kind of like how industrialization allowed us to reduce the work, you know, the work week. But yeah, I'll Certainly, that. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, so I had a question about like how quality of life is different now than it used to be. So not, because we seem to have been talking about how it's different in America compared to what it used to be in America. What do you think about um, how the quality, quality of life, well, it depends on what the definition of quality of life is, but how that compares to maybe the quality of life in a third world country that has never known the American way, the American standard of living, how that is different for them? Do you think their quality of life is actually better because they have more time to, you know, maybe grow their own crops, do their own things, have a more civic mind that they, because they don't have to work towards being the standard in America. They can do what they wish, although they don't have the same access to things as Americans might. You know, oh, I'll, oh, go ahead. I, I'll, 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 you know, I'll take a look at that from it. From again, I'm going to go with the indigenous world, um, whether it's Native American or Aboriginal or Maori or Tongan or what have you. Um, so I would say that yes, um, that uh, where, where, where am I saying with that? Yes, is that uh, you've got cultures who have richness of identity, richness of society. Um, and are not bankrupt in terms of this gross individualism and gross materialism and gross consumerism, which has come to define who we are. And in many ways, I would, I would argue that their lives are richer and freer and fuller because they are richer and freer and fuller in things not associated with the capitalistic colonizing world. Um, uh, that's why I think, you know, I, I look at Native American societies, uh, it's what they struggle so much against is because the overculture seeks to implant in them again and again and again that you've got to adhere to this standard. You, know, what, you need this card, you need to get off the reservation, you need to go to the city, you need to get a job, you need to be corporate, you need to earn this, you need to have this house, you need all this, and in the process what they do is they disassemble or destroy that person's sense of, of unique identity philosophical beliefs, religious perspectives, uh, relationship with the land. You want to talk about a, a bankrupt society that, that, that has no relationship to the land, look at us. We drill it, we dig it up, we pump it full of chemicals, we create earthquakes for, this, for the process of profitability. And so we've lost that, that, that richness, that connectivity with the four-leggeds, with the two-leggeds, with the winged creatures, with the stones, with the, with the rivers, with the mountains, with the, you know, We've lost that, right? And so, boy, standard, yeah, I would say these people have a higher standard limit because they're not encumbered by this artificial identity that we have been projected we have to possess. So I don't know if that answers let your me, question. Let me, let me take it, because you might be surprised that I disagree with Dr. Despain <laughs> on this point, all right? Uh, let's, look at, let's look at nations around the world that have not developed, all right? Mm -hmm. So we're talking outside of Western Europe, outside of North America. But who has, outside not, who has not let those develop? Who out, has extracted oh, 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 or exploited on, those through colonization and kept them you, in a no, repressive no, state? No, hold right? on. No, that's not, yeah, that is yeah, not true. Okay. That's so, not true. All right. So, oh, my gosh. So slow down. you got, you got to let me say it before you disagree with it. All right. So you look at, at those countries. What do you find? Uh, they are, by and large, way more violent. They are, by and large, um, far more, uh, and this is not hard to look up, all right? I mean, this is not hard. The lifespans, we've talked about that. Your lifespan is much shorter in those countries. Uh, you are much poorer, right? They're significantly poorer. Uh, and the measure of this is not hard to find out. Um, what do we see in those countries? Are people trying to get into them because they see that, or are people trying to get out of them? 
right? Yeah, uh, but so, I would argue that the byproduct, that, that what you're seeing with that violence displacement of poverty is all that, the byproduct of colonization. It's a colonization that colonization has been over for over, is, well, colonization no, has no, been no, over no, we're not, oh, no, no, we're still in the midst of colonization. The colonization no. of the mind, the colonization of identities. Those things are still ongoing. Give me an amen, brother. But you have to say that if we're going to deal with the concept, uh, we cannot just, if you want to say that colonization is over, fine. It's not over. But I would say that the legacy of colonization does not stop if you want to say that it ended. It's still there is a still a legacy of displacement, of minorities being pushed to the periphery, of being exploited. I would say that the byproduct of violence and land and poverty and stuff like that is a byproduct of colonization, and that is an extension of this this first industrial, uh, first a colonial, then a modern market, then an industrial, then a casino capitalism. It's still preying upon the same people again and again and again, and the, to the betterment of the small percentage at the top who's sitting in Nichols Hills or wherever they are on Fifth Avenue to the rest of society in the rest of the world that has to struggle and, and, and try to find a place. Um, yeah. Amen. I'm, I'm, maybe we have some differences on defining things, right? What well, is a, we are, what's I, a struggle, I, right? Uh, I think that comes in a lot of the problem is the measurement of how you look on things. And so, and I have a conflict as far as I, I, I tend to look at things on both sides. So I do tend to look at things very economically from the, from the level of inequality distribution that we have and things like that. But then I also have to take my step back and keep tell myself, but even measuring something from that perspective is from, from my ethnocentric standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. That that's what makes Americans happy, so that's how we're measuring. So we talk about something like quality of life, which there's quality of life, or I'm um, sorry, um, life expectancy. But even with life expectancy, then you have to take into hand quality of life, and the question becomes, what is quality of life? So when we look at something like life expectancy has increased, well, that's great, but when we're looking at 2018, how many of us know the elderly who their either mind is still functioning, but they've lost their body, or their body is still functioning, but they've lost their mind? So essentially, they have a longer life expectancy, but how do we measure that quote-unquote quality of life at the time? How do we look at these um, communities or these populations where they have extreme what we would consider poverty. They have more food issues than we do. Or they have um, things that we would go, hey, everything's bad. But you look at them, and by and large, their overall populations tend to be much more happier than we are. They tend to have lower levels of stress than we do, things like that. And so I think always coming at how we quantify these things, how we measure them, how we operationalize them, makes the difference in how we view it as well. And so I think we're looking at apples and oranges in a way. I'd say take your elderly aspect, which I really like. You know, the idea is that we get to the point where we start to look at our elderly. Are they cost effective for us? No, they're not cost effective. So we remove them from the workplace. We put them in a rest home. We say, you go ahead and live the rest of your life over there. And I'm not even going to tear, can't tend to you. I've just, I, I'm, you know, you're a rest home. Here's your money. Uh, it's cheaper for me to, to send my, my great grandfather off there and I don't, and wait for him to die, right? Whereas in some of these other societies, we aren't putting the cost on their identity, on who they are. Those societies take care of. There's a social intertwining. There's a love and respect and all process. And we don't even farm out the burial of that person to, uh, uh, to a mortuary service where the family takes care of it. And the commitment to the community.